and okay, this is John Lewis Scott Morrison. I, I'm a regular investigator in the program with Lewis Scott. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that's, that's maybe unfashionable, but I'm very glad that Chris talked about something similar in his talk, which is defining impact categories. Um, so um, I just, since this is only a 20 minute talk and you know, I don't usually get to talk about these details in the typical uh, talk we give on advantage of the opportunity. So what we want to do is an in-category definition, and there's lots of different ones you know, different purposes of working categories too, so there's no one size fits all definition. You want something that's optimized for working TPOTs. So you want something, a definition for which it's convenient to prove Boolean theorem, and um, it's a lot of complex product theorem that I'll mention for the end. Um, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to unmanageable this vaccine's a check, you know, if you've got some kind of example of this topological origin, which would be pretty easy to show. Um, that sets up the axioms and the simple. You um, want to do the plane of the sort of A infinity type case simultaneously and also define tensor products going on. Um, so the main idea is um, we don't don't scale them So in some sense, you know, we want like, as many conditions as possible, not as few, and that makes things a little easier. Um, and, we, and the, the other thing is we, this duality, which in, in the two category sense means that if we've got, just in case anybody doesn't know, I'm talking about this duality, if I've got a, these are one morphisms A and B, and I've got a C down here, and I have some two morphisms connecting it, there should be you know, some other thing that goes from C and B bar to A. So this, you can move things from the bottom to the top. And in higher dimensions, that gets more complicated and it's related, you know, Jake Murray's recent papers, he talks about an action of the orthogonal group on the categories that he has. And so we we'll, you know, put that in and have things in there too. Um, also, we'll just multiple increases. Okay, so I'm going to spend most of the talk telling you five things. You know, typical category definitions, we have some morphisms, boundary, which are embarrassingly difficult to, to deal with, but I'm also glad that Chris used me to make the work isn't so hard as thing to find. And then in the top dimension then we want some special behavior. Um, and that's where the definition of behavior. For these four, my definition of like an infinity category and plain old category would be the same. Different than different. So we have to decide on the shape of our morphisms. Um, there's like bygones or I've always called these bihedral, but I wonder if it's globular, globes? Globes, okay. for any dimension. Okay. Bygones. Okay, so they can be globes, they can be rectangular things, they can be multiple inputs. This is good to um, Or, and then, and then some definitions, and this is getting closer to what we're actually going to do, um, have like a different rectangle. And maybe you just want to think of the one dimension. You see, it intervals of different length. And you can post two of them together and you get not back where you started with the interval with the sum of the links, and that allows you to um, replace weak associativity with strict associativity. Um, so we like that idea. So um, we're gonna allow we're gonna take this even further, we're gonna allow our shapes, our morphisms to be based on any shape so long that it's from it's from being morphed to a ball. Um, in other words, um, for any K manifold, we just want to work with a ball. We have a set of K morphisms called C sub K of X. So lots and lots of different families of K morphisms. Um, but how are they related together? So what we really want to do is can't use this sometimes. <laughs> for each K in this range, we're a functor for C to K of um, I guess I'll drop the index. Um, <coughs> But the category of K-walls and homing morphisms a category of sets and bijections. So that's that's what our morphisms are. So before giving the rest of the axioms, and anyway, things in blue, those are the official axioms. Um, I should give some examples to keep in mind of where this thing is. Um, oh, I, I should also, you know, when I say balls, what kind of balls? Are they oriented or unoriented? Or, you know, 
And so you get a different type of category for each choice of manifold prime present morphisms. And so I think in particular the sort of spin and pin plus minus um, are kind of interesting in the two dimensional case. Um, okay, so let's quickly run through some examples. Um, we can let T, T is some target, be some topological space, and then we can consider this function C on a K ball X to be a set of all maps from X and T. Um, that's what we do if K is less than the top dimension. And at the top dimension, we take those things modulo homotopy to those with the boundary. So this is, I probably should have written a pi sub less than equal. This is the, the version of the fundamental viewpoint of the space T. Um, the infinity version of that same thing is you start out exactly the same, but then we read the top dimension instead of crudely dividing the state and path components, we can just consider the entire space, or if we're less sophisticated, we're trying less sophisticated, we take singular chains on the entire space. Um, so that's the, the standard example of infinity and infinity. Um, we can let we can take a manifold with embedded cell complexes. So like these pictures, this comes from Cooper work by the um, and then divide out by simulations. So here we would have trivalent graphs, modulo this long list of relations that's related to the group G2. Um, and then a um, more general thing is we could take any, suppose we've got a category under some other definition, like maybe it's a pivotal two category defined in the usual combinatorial way. And we can draw, well, Scott talked about pasting diagrams. I'm going to take the dual sort of thing, which is something called string diagrams. So I can define C's of K of X to be all string diagrams in X. And, and um, if K is less than N, that's in the story. But if K is equal to N, then I divide out by some relations of this, this usual kernel of the evaluation that the Scott was talking about. So this is. Um, this is in some ways sort of like a universal example in the same way this construction of taking a um, sort of traditional category and making it into this sort of topological. Um, okay, so now continuing with the axioms. Um, in, so usually when it talks about the domain and the range, because we've got strong duality, like if you know, we want to be sort of isotropic and we've got this two morphism sitting in this triangle, we want, don't want to make up our minds in advance, you know, which is ingoing, which is outgoing. The value is always present, so it doesn't really make sense to partition the boundary the domain and range. So instead, we're just going to have for each sphere of dimension n minus one or less, um, we're going to have a similar set of fields, homeomorphisms, what we're going to call them. And then we have, um, this boundary, think of this as combined domain and range, goes from C of X to C of this boundary, and this should be a natural transformation of functors. Um, well, I, I said this definition is going to be non recursive, but I am using this sort of plain old one category. So when I say functor, I'm talking about functor. Exactly. Um, and then, on the other hand, we do, if we did have a subdivision of and we've got something specified on this k-ball, specified along that k-ball, meaning it's some k minus one sphere e, and there should be a way of combining that data to get one of these things on the sphere. So roughly we're just saying we've got uh, morphism on two balls and the reason we have to move together for um, So now I'd like to talk about the next set since I need to introduce some notation. Um, but then these things on a sphere, um, the ones that are attainable along by going along E is some subset. Uh, think of it as things that are transverse to E or stable along E. Um, and then given, um, given a C in the, in the boundary of X, X is a ball, or, you know, sort of partitioner, the morphisms into what they, they're on the boundary. So this is all the the morphisms of X because with a specified boundary. You know, Hom sets with definite demand range instead of all morphisms. Um, and we can talk about the things which are split to which after restricted boundaries split it along the um, see. So in most of the examples we're interested in 
you want the category to be enriched in some way. So, so far I've been saying everything is set, but this subset of the set um, should have some extra structure, like it might be a vector space, it might be a topological space, it might be a chain complex. Um, and then all the maps we talked about should preserve that structure upon these things. Let's see. So now, we talk about composing our category. Um, that, that's a lot of words, but it's just the idea that if we've got a morphism on B1 and a morphism on B2, and they're both you know, split all along this sphere here, and when they agree on this ball there, then we can put them together and get something defined on the medium of the moment. Um, and because we've got, you know, I mean, you might think we made our life difficult by having lots of different sets of morphisms, but the payoff is that we don't need associators and higher associators and all this stuff. Everything's just strictly committed to all of those. Um, now that's equivalent if you like sort of opera style definitions of the previous things about composition are equivalent to saying that we've got, you can think of balls decomposing the smaller balls as forming an opera type. Um, you know, for example, if you Going backwards, if I, you know, I've got a ball here divided into three pieces, and I plug in these dot decompositions, and I get some finger decomposition. Or going the other way, we can compose things, and they, they should satisfy an opera style associated with it. Um, <coughs> this has to do with identity. <laughs> um, and this even this is actually this should maybe this should have a little asterisk beside it because this isn't quite adequate. I'll explain why on the next slide, but it's, it's close. Um, so we want we want to think of um, actually I guess what I'm saying is kind of transverse to the pictures Chris was drawing. When he had an identity morphism, he drew it foliated by you know the thing, you know, if I've got an identity from a two-dimensional thing to a two-dimensional thing, he drew a two-dimensional foliation. So I would actually draw the fibers of the the projection on, you know, I think the identity thing is being some kind of product. I map it down onto the object that was its origination, and then I would draw in the fibers. So you see that on the next slide. So, um, so we've got some kind of functor from fields on X to fields on X cross D would be some auxiliary disk. You know, it could be one dimension or higher. And this kind of diagram should commute in, in if this diagram commutes, then morphisms are preserved. And then it should be natural with respect to ruling both the X and the So that's, that's what this is saying. And I guess also associated with the cross of the disk and then another disk. So these, these are all just very natural and obvious conditions we write down. Um, unfortunately, um, we need, so I, this was, I, I guess I was accidentizing this sort of picture, you know, right now it was a, a ball crossing over the ball. But it's often nice to work with these sort of more bygones or globes. So you need a ball when you sort of pinch it along the boundary. And then there's other situations where you want to pinch along this part of the boundary. So what we would really need to do is replace this plain old products with these sorts of things. Um, and then have axioms of, you know, when they glue together, preserving the fibers. So I, you know, that, that can be spelled out, but I'm not really satisfied with the essay when I write down the details. Um, but once we have that, and particularly once we have this kind of object, we can do the following thing. We can start with we've got a ball, X, and we have its set of morphisms associated with that. And now, and this should be in the top dimension. I think I forgot to say that. This is, I'm only specifying this in, in X is in dimension. Um, I can now glue on this product region on the boundary. And now that, that gives us a field by gluing on some, some different ball, X union collar. And now there's a, we just take a homeomorphism a collar map from this back to original map field. And so we end up with some map from fields on X to fields on X. And if you like, you can think of it as the, um, you can imagine a family of homomorphisms which crush this interval smaller and smaller and smaller. And also consider the inverses, and then the limit was well, actually crushed down to nothing. That's, that's kind of what this map is. So why is that the last step while you're restricting to the top dimension? 
it? Um, I'm stricken to this top dimension because I that's all you can actually bootstrap away. So so this this condition of I, I sort of gave these morphisms here, but I haven't yet explained why they're gonna do what we expect for an identity morphism in a category. And so on the next slide, um, I'm gonna make it an axiom that um, in the top dimension they do act as the identity. So this extended isotopy variance, this is for a plane category. Um, if we act by homeomorphisms act trivially, they have non-trivial and lower dimensions. In the top dimension they act trivially, but I want to say something even stronger, which is if I take that map on the previous slide, and sort of, you know, sort of the closure of the size of the population. I want that kind of tribute to. If you think, think about maps into a space, um, it's not enough to say that things are isotopic here. Beyond that. Um, so that's what I would say for plane in category. Um, for the infinity type in category, I would instead say that I've got chains on homeomorphisms of X that acts. This is similar to the at the stop road. And actually, I would want to say you want to suit this up to include those sort of collapse of maps. So again, this is maybe not quite a final form. Um, and that's it. OK, so um, that's the full, I, you know, very few details we've permitted. That's the full definition of a in category with strong, you know, weak in category with strong finality. We need to mention, um, and Um, and I have time left. Okay, so why, I said a little bit in the beginning trying to motivate how this wasn't so different from other definitions of in categories. Let me try to say a little bit more about that. And say, so I, what I want to claim is that, that the definition I've just given is equivalent to the usual one, at least for any of the one or two. Um, so what are the arrows going back and forth? So here's the definition I just gave. Here's something you know, that's maybe a little bit more combinatorial, you know, having fewer morphisms of this thing out, you know, the conditions they need to satisfy. To get from, from here to here, you just use, we, we had a set of morphisms for every ball. We'll just throw away most of that information and just remember what it was for the standard ball. And, and then also take the standard ball, glue it to itself, you know, choose a name morphism. You know, it's the usual story of um, how we would derive it. And so, the claim is you can start with this kind of dish condition, restrict to standard balls, um, you get that sort of thing. Going the other direction, it's that thing I had on the earlier slide, which is you just draw a string diagram based on this traditional link category inside a manifold, and it will satisfy these sorts of conditions. So the traditional link category with duals? With duals, with duals, yes. Everything, everything's weak, and you know, everything's with duals, I sometimes put this in. Um, yeah, so you need duals, because if you didn't have duals, then you wouldn't really be able to make sense of these within the manifold. And, and that's, in some sense, that's a test for duality. You know, if you've got some kind of accentation, I think it's of the duals means in this context, well, the test, if you get the axioms right, is you know, for this construction. Um, so, what I want to talk about next, this is building up to defining a tensor product. Um, I'll talk about colon construction. So we've defined this functor C on manifolds which have to be when we work into a ball, and now I want to extend it to any manifold in some disguised way. This is actually the definition of the um, So here's a, an annulus, a simple manifold that's not a ball. And I want to consider a category whose objects are decompositions of the annulus the manifold into balls. And the morphisms are, I don't know what the course means are anti refinements. You know, we just move some of the balls together. So that forms a big partially ordered set. Um, and to each, um, we, we can have a functor which, given, um, given a decomposition of a bunch of balls x to y, uh, we just take the tensor product of all our morphisms. And so this is just you know, the monoidal product in whatever category you're enriching. Spaces. Well, actually, the vector space in the top dimension is plain old sets in the lower dimension. Um, so now we can um, take, just take the co-limit for home to co-limit. 
um, and just to find out that we see the thing. So we just have some object out here. So I mean, I should have C applied to all these pictures, but you know, it's the universal thing out there, especially on these diagrams. Um, if we're if we're doing the infinity case, where in the top dimension we have like the topological spaces or chain complexes, then we want to do a homotopy code. Um, so, so that's so we'll call that the newfangled log complex. And Scott gave um, a definition in terms of these nested balls, which you know, explains the terminology. But the, the problem with that definition, and this is part of the motivation for the definitions we're giving here is we, we, for various reasons, we needed it to work with a, a infinity sort of input rather than a plane category input. And that was pretty kind of awkward. I, I mean, it could probably be done, but um, it was frustrating us. So we decided we need to redefine what a infinity category is on, so that we can make the construction work. So I'll, we'll just define, um, given some a infinity in category C, which we can just, just say what those are. Um, define the newfangled log complex to be the thing that we construct via this homotopy code. Um, and this is <clears throat> this is a remark. I think you know, there's um, I think both Kevin Gustell and Jacob Brewery have in recent papers talked about something similar. I, I think the difference is that they're in this sort of e infinity algebra space, so it would be in our case like all the morphisms of an in category are trivial up to three n minus one. You know, I have interesting stuff at the time. Otherwise, it's the same. Um, so, so, how does this compare to the old definition? Well, given, given a plane in category C, we can um, construct an A infinity in category just by assigning to a ball, a top dimensional ball in this case, a log complex and Scott defined. Um, that, so, D is here's going to be old fashioned uh, log complex. And so in some sense, this is a free resolution. You know, we, we start with a category, we've got a plane category, we want to find you know, a corresponding A infinity in category, and this is sort of the natural way to do it. We can also, in a way that I, I can't really make precise right now, but this is, this, you should think of this as sort of like a bar construction or something like that. It's a much flabbier resolution than a bar construction, but it has some other dynamics. Um, um, okay, so now this is the product theorem I think I mentioned at the beginning. Consider a manifold, top dimensional manifold down that's a product. Base space Y, fiber N, F. Um, C be a plane in category. Um, and F is going to, but curly F, be the A infinity K category, which assigns to wall X the old fashioned log complex of X cross F. That's the sort of top dimensional piece of this K category. So this is somehow we're, we're taking the homology of the fibers after thinking them up. Um, and so now we can, so this F of Y means now do the co-limit co construction. I take new fangled blob homology of Y with coefficients of F. That's what this compact notation means. And the thing is this is homotopy equivalent to just the old-fashioned blob complex of X F cross Y, which we now have um, and it's not, that's not too hard to prove. Um, and so corollary, if we take F to be a point, then we just get the, the newfangled <coughs> block complex is the same as the old fashion. I'll, I'll, I'll um, okay, so I'm most, mostly out of time, um, so I'll, through the slides quickly in a minute. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we want to define modules. I mean, they're defined in a similar style of you know, marked balls. Um, let's see. So we think of the marked balls representing this situation. We've got a manifold and a collar and some network acting up there. Um, and so we have this parallel definition of you know, cutting these marked balls apart, and that defines infinite modules. Associativity. Um, um, and we can do an, another code construction of where our manifolds might be decorated by modules. Um, and once we have that, we can define a tensor product in two modules to be 
doing that code and construction just on the simple and go open it up. Um, and then we have a gluing theorem, which says if we've got, um, the, you know, we start with some in category C, it could be A infinity or, or not. And we start with a manifold dimension K, then um, associated to the, to the boundary, we have um, I, I guess this should be k plus one. So we have k plus one category associated to the boundary. Um, we have representations on the right and left as associ associated to that. And if we take this tensor product in this sense to find up here, we construct the k category, we're using the category plus for the whole manifold. So this is the, the blue ring here. TKFT. Um, in a fairly general context, it looks a lot more as well. Um, so that's you know, just from the <coughs> So again, I, this is a slide. Um, you know, the point of um, coming up with the other another definition in categories is we want to make theorems like this. <laughs> Just, just for n, n equals one and two. In the, so for the plane categories, for n equals one and two, and for infinity categories, just for n equals one. Um, so just those cases. But for, yeah, I just need to get something like three categories of the rules. Yeah, it's hard the to other find. person's problem to come up with a definition <laughs> of what those are, but especially yeah. the rules. Yeah, so you can claim that it's not your fault for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if, if, you know, if someone else had that definition, I don't know if I would have the energy to. <laughs> <laughs> That's but you can wait until they come up with it. So they call you a lot of Any other questions or comments? So, thank all of you for coming. The session is closed. <laughs>